On the 25th of November, 1884, um, the first steam route to Perry Bar was opened. Formally, it was for, followed shortly afterwards by Mosley uh, in, in December, 1884, and Sparkbrook in May, 1885, and it was extended to College Road in 1900. Lazelle's, the 18, eight, October, 1885, Saltley, November 1885, Small Heath, January 1886, Mosley via Borsal Heath, uh, July 1886, and that was then extended to King's Heath in February 1887 and Wheeler Street in October 1886. Uh, the initial rolling stock consisted of 10 numbers 1 to 10 Falcon four wheel horse cars for Neutral's route and 14, 1 to 14 uh, Kidston trams, locos, um, and 13 number 1123 Falcon trailer cars, all delivered in 1884. In 1886, the company produced the portion of track of the Birmingham Tramway Company Limited, which lay outside the city boundary, along with 18 horse cars. But at the same time, Birmingham leased the lines within its boundary. The service commenced with numbers 75 to 94. Vulcan topped open bogey double deckers in 1889. A portion of the acquired tramway along Bristol Road to Bourne Brook was closed for reconstruction and reopened in July uh, 1890 and was worked by numbers 101 to 112 Vulcan battery open top double deck cars. <clears throat> and this is one of the um, the double deck um, battery cars. And of course, they were called accumulator battery trams, um, which I find quite amusing. The fact that they were sort of boasting that they now got trams that were battery operated in the centre of Birmingham, as if it was something uh, something new. The first steam tramway in Birmingham was opened in by the Birmingham and Aston Tramway Company in December 1882. The 3 foot 6 inch narrow gauge tramway was constructed under Birmingham and Aston Tramway Order of 1880 and ran from Aston Street in Town Centre to Whitton via Aston Cross, where it diverged at one route tramway via Park Lane and Whitton Lane and the other via Litchfield Road and Church Lane. The initial rolling stock consisted of six Kits and Locos in a crimson livery and 10 Starbuck double trailer cars in cream. In February 1885, a branch line of, to the foot of Gravelly Hill from Litchfield Road was opened with a connection to Eddington being provided by the company's horse buses. On the 30th of June 1902, Aston Manor Urban District Council purchased that portion of the tramway within their boundary in order to electrify it, whilst the remaining section passed to Birmingham, City, Birmingham Corporation on the 1st of January 1904 on the expiry of the lease. This is the obviously the, the tram driver and the uh, conductor of the... Um, Tram. The City of Birmingham Tramways Limited was formed on the 29th of September 1896 to take over the assets of Birmingham Central Tramways Company with the intention of converting the whole system to overhead electric traction. It was anticipated the approval uh, of Birmingham Corporation would be forthcoming. However, negotiations broke down uh, on the 7th of June. 1898 without agreement. Nevertheless, the conversion went ahead. On the 14th of May 1901, the battery electric cars on Bristol Road route were replaced by overhead electric traction, the initial service being operated by numbers 1512161 to open top double deckers from the electric right and tramway company carriage works in Preston. I think we forget that uh, people used to just sit in open trams at, when, uh, originally. Um, it seems quite strange today to think of that. In June 1902, 
control of the company passed to BT, who began negotiations with the surrounding authorities. In consequence, Birmingham's decision reached on the 7th of March 1899 to work the tramway system in the city themselves. Just mentioning about Birmingham Electric, British Electric Traction, um, they were a massive company. Um, they owned, they did, their intention was to own all the all the tramways in the country. Um, <clears throat> but they, they, their portfolio right up until, I think they've disappeared now, but they, um, they hold it, they held Leonard Lee's investments, which meant that they ended up with Biffa. So the, the company is still, the BT is, is still there in one sense, which I find quite interesting. Um, but this made it all even more complicated. Uh, the BT maintained that if this came to fruition, then it would be necessary to change cars every time one reached the boundary and through running could only be guaranteed if BT were in control of all the tramway. In 1903, they promoted a bill which would have given them compulsory running powers over Birmingham Corporation track. The corporation, however, realising that through running was required where prepared to come to some agreement, but argued against the compulsion and the bill was defeated. I think it's a similar sort of thing that we used to have in Birmingham, where when you lived within the Birmingham boundary, if you caught a Midland Red bus, you paid twice the fare. And it was because Birmingham had to pay, uh, Midland Red had to pay Birmingham um, City Transport, the um, the fare that they picked up from you um, within their boundary. So you only caught a Midland Red bus if you were in a desperate hurry, if um, you lived within the boundary. On the 9th of June 1903, the company was granted a 21-year lease of the tracks of former Birmingham and Aston Tramway Company by Aston Manor Europe and District Council. Um, <clears throat> and cars 189 to 216 delivered in 1903 and 1904 in the Crimson and Cream livery actually carried the coat of arms of Aston Manor Urban District Council on the site, even though they were owned by the company. Services commenced in September 1904 when the first car in Aston ran between Aston Church and Steelhouse Lane, Birmingham, <clears throat> by arrangement with Birmingham Corporation. Further routes in Aston were opened in October 1904, which was Victoria Road to Six Ways, and in November 1904, Aston crossed to Gravelly Hill, and then it was extended to Erdington in April 1907. When I look at this picture, I look at these um, lads stood here. Uh, I'm not sure whereabouts in Birmingham this is, but it looked to me like it could have been um, the area where my father grew up. And that would be, the, my father would have been the same generation as these kids. It's, uh, it does seem rather strange. Um, however, most of the company's leases in Birmingham expired on, in December 1906, which was also the last day of steam operation in Birmingham. And on the 30th of June 1911, the company leased on, leased on the routes to Cottridge via Persia Road, Selly Oak and Bristol Road, and the cable tramway to Handsworth expired. Uh, the remaining services passed to Birmingham Corporation on the 30th of December 1911, with 61 electric cars leaving the way clear for the corporation to unify and expand the tramway system. Construction by Birmingham Western District Tramways Limited under Birmingham and Western District Tramways Order of 1881. This three foot six inch gauge steam tramway was opened by the newly formed 22nd of um, 
November 1883 Birmingham Midland Tramway Limited. The tramway was originally planned to run from Kingsley through the city, although Birmingham did not become a city until 1889. The convenience of it always referred to as such. Um, and along Dudley Road to Albury, to Albury and Dudley and includes a number of proposed branch lines, which would, would have been around 28 route numbers. Uh, in the event, just over 12 miles were constructed, mainly single track route from Birmingham, Summer Row, along Dudley Road to Smerwick, Albury, Tiverdale, and Dudley with two branch lines serving West Bromwich, uh, from West from Smerwick via Spon Lane and from Albury via Bromford Lane. Service commenced on 6th of July 1885 on the section of track from Summer Row to the city boundary, which had been constructed by Birmingham Corporation was on lease until the 30th of June 1906 and through a service to Dudley commenced in August uh, 1885. The initial fleet uh, consisted of 12 Kitson tram locos towing Albury Trail of cars in dark green and cream livery, operating from the depot at West, West Perry. Uh, the tramway was not financed, was not a financial success and services on the branch lines from West Bromwich ceased in 1892. However, they were reopened in 1983, sorry, 1893, and operated under a lease by, B, by Mr B Crowther, reportedly a local undertaker. Um, with two of his own single deck horse cars and two company owned metropolitan single deckers until electrification in 1903. The company came under the control of BET in February 1900, who intended to electrify the system, leases being obtained from the local authority involved, authorities involved. Uh, the first lines to be electrified with the branch lines into West Brom along Spong Lane, Bromford Lane, which operated, which opened on the 3rd of November 1903, and were worked temporarily by South Staffordshire Company cars, no electric cars having yet been delivered to the Birmingham Midland Company. Uh, the Birmingham to Dudley route was opened to electric cars in November 1904, along with a new branch line from Cape Hill along Bearwood Road to Bearwood. On 31st of December 1904, another branch line uh, along Heath Street to the city boundary was opened, this actually being constructed by the Birmingham and Western Districts Tramways Company in 1886, but had laid unused until now. The extension to Soho Station and Smerwick on the 25th of May 1905. The lease of all these lines within the city of Birmingham expired in June 1906 and all short workings within the city passed to Birmingham Corporation as though the company continued to work through uh, the through service to Dudley and the branch lines to West Brom on the 30th of August, 13th of August 1912 the name of the company was changed to the Birmingham District Power and Traction Company. But from the 1st of April 1928, Birmingham Corporation took over the main line through the through Dudley working of the West Bromwich branches where tra were transferred to the Dudley Downbridge District Electric Tramway Company. As a result, Birmingham District Power Traction Company ceased to be tramway operator, although the company itself continued in existence, changing its name to Birmingham District Investments Trust Limited the following year. Birmingham Corporation Tramways operated a network of trams in Birmingham from 1904 until 1953. It was the largest narrow gauge tramway network in the UK, built to a gauge of three foot six inches. It was the largest tramway network in the UK after London, Glasgow and Manchester. There were a total of 843 trams 
with a maximum of 825 in service at any one time, 20 depots, 45 main routes, and a total route length of 80 and a half miles. Birmingham Corporation built all the tramways and leased the track to various companies. Birmingham was a pioneer in the development of reserve track tram, sorry, reserve trackway which served the suburban areas as city as the city, sorry, which served the suburban areas of the city as the city grew in the 1920s to 30s. And if you think about Bristol Road, that's why Bristol Road has got that very wide lovely grassed trees centre reservation it was because that was the reserve track for the trams uh, although the corporation owned the track all the tracks within the city boundary it was not until 1904 that it commenced operations in its own right um, in that year the lease on the birmingham portion of the birmingham and aston tramways expired the corporation took over the line electrified it and reopened the section from Steelhouse Lane to the boundary using United electric car, double deck, open top, bogey cars, and the 20 in number. All the leases on the Birmingham's, uh, uh, sorry, all the leases on the City of Birmingham Tramways Company's tracks slowly expired. They were taken over by the corporation. On the 1st of January 1912, the operating rights, the last remaining lengths of track passed to the corporation along with a number of companies trams and they were now in control of the tracks within the city boundary which had already been expanded by the absorption of several neighboring smaller authorities this is what i was talking about earlier with the um, the lower bridges there's no way the cable could be at this height. So it had to be sent along the side so that the pole, which I think that's the pole there, is actually touching, is actually connected to the cable. Um, that posed quite a serious problem. As I say, it happened in a lot of different spaces where there were low bridges in Birmingham. Uh, following World War One, the system continued to expand into the comprehensive network of long routes extending to the city boundary in all directions from a number of central termini linking with other undertakings at several points. Connections were made with the Black Country Network, a BT at Ladywood, uh, and at Hansworth with the with South Staffs Company, whose loss of, of the West Bromwich lease sparked the collapse of the Black Country um, ideal. In 1924, Birmingham Corporation took over West Brom lease, enabling Birmingham trams to reach Dudley in the west. On the 1st of April 1928, the corporation took over the main line route to Dudley on the former Birmingham and Midland Tramway companies. It had been renamed the Birmingham District Power Traction Company in 1912. Uh, later that year, in 26th of August, the late last major tram route to Stetchford opened. In, in 26th of November 22, trolley buses replaced the route to, to Neutrals, and although tramway abandonment did not gather pace until the 1930s, the decline had already started. Uh, the route to the bottom, uh, to Bolton Road, was abandoned in May 1913, quickly followed by the Hadley Road route in the in August 13, and by 1939, the Lazales Yardley Stratford Road and Acup Screen West Bromwich Dud and Dudley routes had all been replaced. However, the bulk of the system remained in use throughout the war years until 19 until 1947, when wholesale closure of the system started. On the 4th of July 1953, the last three routes to Shortheath, Pipeys and Erdington closed simultaneously and over 70 years of tramway operation in Birmingham came to an end. Um, one of the things I found interesting was that one of the excuses they gave 
for doing away with the trams was they caused traffic jams with the buses and other vehicles. Um, and I just find that rather amusing with the fact we've gone back to trams. Be interested to see in 10 years' time if they start saying, oh dear, the trams are causing traffic jams. Um, but the, f the reason why the tramway system survived to 1953 was a direct result of the war. It would have been abandoned long before then if it hadn't been for the war. The war kept the system open. The second of two experimental tram cars arrived in 1929, although too late to save the tram network from, com from the competition of the, the bus. In 1930, the second experimental car arrived, which was number 843, um, which is the one in the picture, built by Brush Electric Engineering Company Limited of Loughborough. Its up-to-date sleep lines must have done much to improve the image of Birmingham's trams yet it seated only 60 passengers, two less than the standard tram, and not many not many than a double-deck bus today of that period, which was, of course, 54 to 56. They tried to improve the appearance of the trams. Um, the first one on the left, the partition halfway along the seats was to prevent passengers being catapulted uh, into each other in the event of an emergency stop. Um, the ship's bulkhead type light, lighting and the dark varnish wood gave a rather gloomy appearance to the lower saloon. I must admit the trams I travelled on when, when I was a child were gloomy like this and these were because they're the ones from Selly Oak that I travelled on. Um, the centre one, um, an even better effect was achieved by the, the decor of this tram and, and also an, an improvement with the lighting. It's, they've just got ordinary um, bayonet cap lamps, 12 volt, 12, I don't know whether they were 12 volt, they were on the buses. Um, and it gave, uh, they put light coloured um, seat upholstery, cork lined floor and dome ceiling, um, gave a much more spacious effect um, to the lower saloon. And the right hand one, um, the seats were cushioned with sponge rubber and upholstered in a bright brown and red mosaic. Um, I, I went to work out what mosaic was because I thought I must find out what it is because. Um, so I was thought I might be asked a question. It's like a carpet. And um, <clears throat> I remember on the buses, on the downstairs of the buses, they had this type of, of covering and it was very nice and it was very hard wearing. And the maple veneer ceiling panels in, uh, improved and then the silver looks light and contributed to a much better effect uh, on the inside of the coach of the buses. This is an example of the upper deck of the last batch of standard tram cars delivered to Birmingham, um, made by Brush. They were made by Short Brothers. Um, they offered greater degree of comfort to the passengers. The upper deck had leather upholstered seats and improved lighting. The vestibule at the top of the stairs was a major improvement. I think um, this sort of doorway at the top meant that there wasn't so drafty. Um, it was a, a much better arrangement. The Not Screen Road Works had begun a running depot and, uh, and also an administration works for the city of Birmingham Tramways Company and was acquired by Birmingham Corporation in January 1907. It remained the centre of repair shop for trams and trolley buses until the closure of the system in 52. This view <coughs> of the works was taken in 1908 when it was still partly used as a running shed. Tram cars 8 and 31 in the repair tracks in the front, the small hand operated transverse. Um, and that's 
looks like it's the um, motor out of one of the tram cars. And um, it's quite interesting. They've actually taken the bogies. By the looks of things, they've removed the bogies from this tram. That's the internal layout of the um, engine shed. And in this photograph, only three men appear to be working while the rest of them are posing for their photos for the photographer. Uh, and I found it interesting looking around at these men. And what I was trying to do was trying to work out who the foremen were. Um, these guys up here by their white aprons are, are either painters or carpenters. I couldn't make up my mind. But very few are wearing overalls. This guy is and some of these are here. But I'm assuming because these guys are wearing cow gowns that these these are the supervisors. Um, but um, it's very much a, a posed picture with um, guys stood up on top here as well. 